Dear Heavenly Father, I just praise you and thank you for your goodness and grace. And thank you for again, Lord, being there and protecting your servant, your anointed one, Daryl, Lord God. I thank you and praise you for that and protecting the family, Lord. We thank you for just the way you watch over your children, Lord God. And Father, we just uh, lift up those who are in our, in our congregation now who are just going through uh, just hard times, Lord. We lift up uh, Ellie as she is working in Seattle right now, Lord, we pray that you would just continue to give her pain relief from her, her neck pain, and, and Lord, just pray for your healing, and that, Lord, whether it be through a miracle or through a, the, the doctor's surgery, Lord God, we just pray for healing, Lord God, and we just lift her up to you and pray that you would bless her time there. Father, we lift up Ethel, Lord, continue to pray for her, just your strengthening her body and, and uh, relieving her of the pain of the arthritis, Lord God. Father, we lift up Cindy to you, and uh, just continue to pray, Lord God, for her uh, back as well, Lord God. And just the, the others who are here who are just going through a, a lot of things right now. Father, we just uh, pray, Lord God, that you would continue and we, uh, to watch over your flock. And Father, we thank you for your protection. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, praise the Lord. And uh, as uh, was shared that Daryl was in a car accident, but it's not on? Oh, yeah. This one? I have a very soft voice, so. All right. Good? This one? Okay. All right. Well, praise the Lord that uh, God, again, watched, watched over the, the church, and the, this church has been through a, a lot. And uh, so. Again, God continues to protect the church. And this morning, before we get into the sermon, I'm going to do a mission sharing. And it's really a transition time for, for uh, our family, as uh, this church has been supporting us for the last 20 years, 14 years uh, in Japan, and the last six years working at the GEMS headquarters in L.A. And um, just want to thank you and and. You know, we couldn't have uh, done it without your support. And just want to show a picture. I want to give a brief history because we are in the process of, of, of uh, transitioning out of our, our mission. That's right. Okay, transitioning out of our mission and. Uh, out of jams, and we're going to be going back into the secular workplace. This was 2003. <laughs> this is when we were sent to Japan. But I just want to start, first of all, at 1980. 1980, when I was working at Disneyland, a member of this church was reaching out to me, and another of other Christians who was reaching out to me in Disneyland. And... Um, I came to this church in 1980 where I was led to the Lord. This is the beginning of that what brought us to this point. To this, it was a time where I was lost. I was, I was into partying. I was into sin. I was into bad things. And I could have gone in two different directions, but God sent this person from this church to reach out to me. And this church from that time was a part a huge part of my spiritual growth. And I, and I share this because sometimes, you know, as we go to the general conference, I give people, you know, I picked up some people, I picked up five people. Four of those people are from San Lorenzo. They're a delegate. I'm, they're the English delegates. I was the only English delegate from our church because they're smaller. And it made me think, you know, God's family comes in different shapes and sizes. And God's church just comes in different shapes and sizes. One of the things sometimes we would think of in the church body, the Orange County Church has kind of stayed the same size for, for a number of years. And sometimes we could look at that as, what's wrong? In fact, Calvin and I remember when we used to meet, we used to go, what's wrong with our church? But you know what? There's, every, every church has sin. There's always, every, every church filled with sinners. But I believe God uses this church just the way we are, in the midst of our weakness. God has, re has used this church in our lives, and I know a number of other people's lives, over the years, 
where out of the ministry of this church, hundreds of thousands of people were reached for Jesus Christ. This church is the size God wants it to be. And it'll grow when God wants it to grow. And as we, when we get into the scripture, we're going to look at one of the minor prophets. The minor prophets were speaking the word of God. They were speaking the word of God. And some of them had great results, and some of them had zero results. One of the great evangelists was Noah. He only saved his family. The most prosperous or the most successful missionary was Jonah. And he hated the people he was witnessing to. But as we remain faithful, God is doing a good work. So, 1980, came to know the Lord. This is the history of the Lord working through this church, and, and it's a part of the heritage of this church. Because 1987, we're married. We were at this church. I married my beautiful wife, and it was the beginning of a journey. Shortly after that, we moved to San Diego. 2003, and we were there. We, our, our plan was to be missionaries in Japan, right when we got married, 1987. You know, I was going to seminary. We were like the ideal couple. You know, we moved to San Diego. Marriage fell apart. We struggled and out of ministry for a while. But at the San Diego church, they loved on us. They brought us through. They gave us grace. We were out of ministry for a while. They brought us, restored us back in the ministry. And in 2003, we were, well, actually in 2000, we were called back into ministry through the confirmation of God's word and through the confirmation of the San Diego church and this church. It's the San Diego church and this church are our two home churches. Nancy is, a, that's her home church. My spiritual birth is here. Nancy's spiritual birth is in the San Diego church, though, our other holiness church. She's a third generation. Her grandparents were the first baptized members of the San Diego church. So we've only known in the United States two churches, this church and the San Diego church. And that, that's who we are. That's our, that's our heritage. But in 2003, we were called to go to Japan. It was not the timing we had thought. I was already 45. I was a plumber. I had my own business. God blessed me to, to be able to sell the business which is difficult to do for a small company like that. And we took uh, a high school student and a junior high student, and, and Joseph was four years old at that time. He got a lot taller, huh? <laughs> and, and look, when you look at that picture, it's true, though, that we've all changed, except for Nancy, right? <laughs> Isn't that true? And that's my blessing and her curse. But anyway. So, uh, Okay, 19, okay, 2003, and then we served eight years in Okinawa, and I, I would tell people in Okinawa, how long are you going to serve in Okinawa? I said, shinumare, until we die. We were not coming back. But I did tell my sister, if she ever needed help with my parents, that of course I'm, I'm coming back. But other than that, we were not coming back. And then 311 hit, and 311 hit uh, was the triple disaster, the tsunami earthquake, and the nuclear disaster where we went and it broke our heart to see so many people who lost everything, who were hopeless. And so we moved to that area and we were there for two years. In Sendai, we worked in Sendai, but I mean, we lived in Sendai, but we worked in Ishinomaki because that's where it was mostly devastated and there was no housing there. So we, it was about an hour drive and we worked there and, and God did miracles. My Japanese was pretty poor. And most of you know I'm, I'm dyslexic, so my English is pretty poor. And I thought, I was praying for a miracle, right? And I believe in miracles, but he, in, his, in God's wisdom, he didn't give me that miracle of language. So, but, but in, in, in Iwakuni, I was teaching the Bible in, in Japanese. I was reading the scripture, and I was speaking very simple, bad Japanese. <laughs> And out of that birthed the church. They said, I tried to get them to go to other places. They said, no, why don't you start a church? So we started a church. I'm not, I wasn't a church planner, never called to be a pastor. But it was a miracle. Should not happen, humanly speaking. So we're 
preaching, I'm leading worship. I can't sing. I can't keep a beat. I, if I clap, I have to do that without singing. Because if I sing, I mean, you know, I can't do this both at the same time. And Nancy's always hitting me when I get off beat. And I noticed yesterday I was clapping during the worship and one of the guys started he started looking over to me. And, and, and I was leading worship. That's, that's impossible. I can't. That's, I'm, I don't have the ability to do that. My iPad, bilingual worship. And, and it was a miracle. And it, it all flowed out of the ministry that happened in this church. Because God saved me at this church. This is where I went through difficulties. This is where people came around me and prayed for me. This is where I was able to grow. I was able to, to start teaching. The first time I wanted to teach, they said, okay, we have a class for you. The nursery class. <laughs> you know, where Estelle and John, you know, Jonathan were there. And uh, so I did the nursery. I'll do anything, you know. I just wanted to serve. And I was, they allowed me to serve, even as a new Christian. And just, just little by little, they gave me more and more I could do. And so... But it came down to, we were there. And then the next picture is earlier this year. So this is what we look like now. We're missing one grandchild. I have four, four grandchildren. We just, this is a new picture of uh, Emma that was uh, born in April. April, thank you. And uh, Peyton is not in the picture, but this is our, our family now. And just God's blessing. If I had not, if God not had, had not, but he didn't, he used this church. And I, I want to encourage you that this is a really good church. And uh, I thank you. We, as we are winding down our ministry, that um, everything that had happened in our ministry, this church also gets credit for. It's, it's a crown. And, and it totally was, was not was not us it was it was the lord and that's the way church is right it's it's the lord just working in a, in a body of believers to do good things and so i just want to thank you for that as we're winding down so presently i'm the gym's director uh so i came back from japan and and it was to take care of my my mom my sister said roy come home i need you to help with mom I said, okay. So I, I took one year to close down the ministry. We came back. I didn't have a job. So I immediately, you know, got a business license, fictitious name, and was going to start Toma Home Repair. Because I didn't have a contractor's license either. I let it expire. And so I was going to be a handyman. And then the Rick asked me, our uh, executive director at GEMS, could you be the uh, Japan director? They haven't had one in 20 years. And, and I said, I don't think I can do it. And he said, we haven't had one in 20 years. Whatever you could do is better than nothing. I thought, I could do that. <laughs> when you set the bar at that level, I said, that, that I could do, better than nothing. Okay. So what I could, and anyway, the last six years, I didn't know what I was doing. But God, step by step, he gave me what I needed to do. First thing we needed to do is member care. We needed to increase. We need to, to grow the way we take care of our, our missionaries. We need to get the missionaries involved in helping one another community. We, we needed to develop a better training for, for our missionaries. So we developed a training program. We actually worked with another organization to help train them on how to raise uh, ministry partners. Uh, another thing we're doing, we, we had to rewrite the, the manual. The manual was written, the, our ministry manual was written, written in 1994 when we had our first missionaries. And, um, you know, there was a, a number of things. An, another thing came up was that we have seven Japanese national spouses, uh, one husband and four, four wives. And one thing came, came up when uh, one of the missionaries asked, you know, what, if I were to pass away, what's going to happen to my wife? And the, the way our organization was is we didn't have a legal entity in Japan. And so um, that's, what we had, that's what we're doing now, is getting a legal entity, entity in Japan so that if something happened to one of our American spouses, that our organization could hire on the, the other spouse and be able to use the support money that they have to give to their family. Otherwise, we had no way of, of taking care of them. And so we're, we're in the last stages of that. And, um, and 
also in that we're, we are having a new Japan field director. So that was one of my visions when taking on the job was to work myself out of a job. So the field director's coming on, and this should happen by the end of the year. So actually, I, we are going to be ending our ministry with GEMS in, in the middle of uh, January, this coming January. But I want, could you shoot that, la that next picture for you? And this is just a picture of our, our missionaries now. We have over, we have about 40 missionary units, meaning families or singles, and uh, 33 children that are still at home. And uh, God has been really blessing the ministry. And now it's time for me to hand it over to somebody else. And it was the vision. Rick said, you can stay as long as you want. My support is good. I don't have to leave. <laughs> Financially, you guys have been blessing. There's so many faithful people who have been blessing. So our support is good. But I think it's... I, I, uh, I, t I tell people, it's kind of like Joe Willie Namus. Okay, some of you guys are football fans. Uh, Joe Willie Namus was a very famous football player. And, and he won a Super Bowl. He's a big underdog. But he was one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. But his knees got messed up. But at the end of his career, he came and played. I'm a Rams fan. He came and played for the Rams. Uh, he should have retired the year before. <laughs> when God, and I look at that as a spiritual sense. When God calls you, when, he, when you finish what God has you to do, then you move on to the next thing. Some people, when I was looking yesterday at, at the conference, some of these pastors are called. They're ordained for the pastorate. For life in retirement they're still pastoring for me i have i finished somebody asked me are you, do you do you feel like there's anything unaccomplished in your ministry with jim no the legal entity is happening you know there's people that are taking care of that there's i'm finished i'm clear conscious i don't have to leave but i'm excited for uh what the lord has next and uh so you can pray for us about that. I'm starting a plumbing business again. I renewed my contractor's license, and I'm going to be starting a plumbing business. I'm going to be 65. If I blow up my knee, then I'll just start a different business or work some other job. But I know that God has, has, is moving us on, and so I'm not sure exactly what it looks like. But every time we move on to something new, it's always difficult, but God is there. <laughs> right, Nance? All right. But let's... Okay, I just wanted to share a little bit about the, the ministry in Japan and, and just, uh, yeah, just the Lord has been blessing. But one thing that is, hasn't changed in Japan, still over 99% of the people in Japan, if they were to die today, would spend eternity in eternal torment. So the work in Japan is, is not done. And so thank you. And I, I will still be involved with the ministry in Japan. My, at, at my age now, I'm more involved with mentoring. So I mentor some of the missionaries and... And some of the people here, that's my heart, is to mentor people, you know, and uh, so, but continue to please pray for Japan and sending people to Japan. And, uh, yeah, Satan is a deceiver, and he's, he's continuing to try to keep things the same, but things are changing. But let's get into the word now, and, and uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just praise you and thank you for your goodness and grace, and I thank you for for this church and just how you have used them in, in my life and Nancy's life and so many people's lives over the years. And the fruit of this church's ministry we shall never know until the day we come into you in eternity, Lord God. But we thank, I thank you for this body. I thank you for the way they love, the way they love us, the way they love um, your word, Lord God, and um, for your continued blessing. Amen. Father, and I pray as we get into your word that you would speak to us through your word, that we would decrease and that you would increase, Lord. And Lord, we thank you that your word is all powerful to change lives, and we pray that you would change our hearts and change our lives today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to look at Hosea chapter 1. We're going to cover the whole chapter. 
So Hosea is the book right after uh, Daniel. It's a... Okay, so Hosea is, is one of the minor prophets, and the term minor does not mean minor in importance, but just it's referring to its length. Like every book in the Bible is, is important. However, this book uh, is my favorite. <laughs> I, I, I love this because it really, this book really shares the heart of God's, I mean, the, the, the heart of God towards his people, the depth of his love, but it also shares, or is an example of more than I think any other book in the Bible, besides seeing Jesus on the cross in the Gospels, it shows the pain that God goes through over our sin. So in the book of Hosea, the Lord asked the prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute. And in the 14 chapters, we see a real life allegory of God showing his love for his people. And it's just a powerful portion of the Bible. Hosea's ministry was during the 8th century BC in the reign of, of the sons, son of, sons of Solomon. It was a time when Israel was divided into two kingdoms, the ten tribes of the northern kingdom, Israel, and the two southern tribes known as Judah. Hosea lived in the northern kingdom and prophesied mostly to the northern tribe. His ministry spanned four kings, and his message was to tell the Israelites of the coming judgment due to their wickedness. The northern kingdom was, was wicked, in, wicked indeed. Although they continued to worship the Lord and keep his feasts, kept his feasts, they were also worshiping other gods. And they, there was lawlessness, there was sexual immorality, even to the point of child sacrifice. And it was all part of their worship at this time. And this was, this was Israel. And so when we look at this first chapter of, of Hosea, we'll see some parallels to what's happening in the world today, and in, including the United States. This morning in, in Hosea chapter 1, we'll see some of the ways we can stay centered in God in the midst of the times we are in. Because let's face it, we are in turbulent times. But God's word helps us get centered. Let's read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. I know most of you have the ESV, but so it'll be a little different. That same meaning. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea the son of Barry in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. God sends Hosea to give his message to the northern kingdom who had turned away from following him. At this point, the people had many warnings the things, that, but they, things continued to get worse. This, during this time, also the prophets Isaiah, Amos, and Micah were also speaking the word of God to the people at this time. But the people of the northern kingdom, Israel, had reached the point of no return. It had already been set by the Lord that it was a done deal. The Assyrians are going to come, and they are going to wipe out the northern tribe. And we're going to see how as we go into this text, how this judgment was another example of God's love. The Assyrians, right? The Assyrians, we've heard the Assyrians. The Assyrians were known for the create. they were known to be the creator of terrorism. They were such evil people that, that people feared them so much that uh, they, they would commit suicide before allowing themselves to be captured by the Assyrians and just the atrocities they did. The capital of Assyria was Nineveh, the city where the prophet Jonah preached, and they repented. But this is a hundred years later. They returned to their sin. So judgment is coming, and God was still sending his prophet. The people had sinned. There was wickedness, but God was still reaching out to them. He was sending the prophet. And this is the heart of the Lord. Even in the midst of, 
of judgment, he's sending his, his prophets to them. He, he, he desires, well, in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wishes no one to perish, but most of the people did not listen to God's warning. As Satan has done from the beginning in the Garden of Eden to today, was spreading lies through false prophets and priests. People were hearing lies, and many of them believed the lies. Satan's plan is the same today. As in Hosea's time, many things are being believed that are true, that as truth that are total in opposition to God's word. Psalm 119.105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And, and I look at the word of God when I read that, I think of a flashlight, right? In, in darkness, like power, we had a power outage recently in our, in our neighborhood. And um, I had a couple of generators, praise the Lord. But a flashlight, right? Everything is black. A flashlight brings, brings light. That is God's word. In the darkness, darkness of what's going on, we go to God's word. And it gives us life. We start understanding why things are, are the way they are. And it gives us hope. For us, we need to be in God's word so that God's word and the power of the Holy Spirit can change our hearts. Verse 2 of Hosea says, When the Lord began to speak to Hosea, the Lord spoke. And all the people had to do was listen. We have the word of God. He has spoken to us. One of the darkest times in my life as a, as a Christ follower was when we were in Togo, when we, the 311, after the disaster. It, and I've shared this before, but it was the time of miracles, right? We were doing great things. People were coming to the Lord, planning a church. It, the other side of that, it was the darkest time spiritually for me. We were so busy. We were having teams come. And, you know, we had one shower, so sometimes I wouldn't shower until like 2 or 3 in the morning because, yeah, you know, I'd be a host. I'd be the last person to shower. And when you're mucking out places with mud and dead fish and whatever is out there, you have to take a shower. We, we, we smelled bad. And um, we'd get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and we'd go out because people were dying. People were uh, without hope. People needed to hear the gospel, and we had the gospel and, and we were, we had to go, right? And it was, it was to the point where we didn't have boundaries. And uh, Nancy, uh, praise the Lord, she was able to be uh, gracious. But it was a time that was struggling in a marriage. I struggled in my relationship with the Lord because I didn't have time to read the Word. I was too busy for God doing the things of God. And it got dark. And it's like being in a dark place, and it's your only source, it's the flashlight, and the batteries go out, and it's darkness. So there was a dark time. God was doing, in spite of that, God was doing wonderful things, but because of that darkness, it affected me, probably to this day. You know, I, would, I had just started having anxiety attacks. I started, uh, you know, my hands started shaking when I would speak. Even when I came back, I was doing my daughter's wedding and just sharing about my daughter. But she noticed that my hands were shaking. It's because I had lost all confidence because I was in a dark place. Did I ever turn away from the Lord? Did I ever fall away from the Lord? No, I didn't. But I wasn't in God's word. And that's another thing that happened here at this church. Is I was, it was a place of recovery for me. I was able to get in God's word. And even Daryl, him preaching through the word of God, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, filled me. It, being able to do Sunday school and getting into God's word restored me. And God's word is so important. And when, without it, we will perish. And... Um, In that psalm it says, the word of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 
Today, my time with God's word and prayer is a priority. So what do I do as a gym's director? You know, as I pass it on to Paul Mizuki, who's going to be taking over my position, and Rick Chuma, what is my number one priority as a gym's director? I spend a good chunk of my time in God's word. I spend a good time in prayer. You know, I, I am blessed by Pastor Darrell when he says he prays for us every day. I pray. I don't pray for you all every day, but I pray for a lot of you every day. <laughs> but I pray for my missionaries every day. And I pray for our pastor. And I know that heart. What Daryl was saying that, I know that heart. That, that is a heart of a pastor. That is a heart of somebody who loves his, his flock. And that is a heart of somebody who knows that his flock is constantly being attacked by the evil one because he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus Christ came to give life and give it abundantly. And prayer makes a difference. God inhabits the praise of his people, but he also hears our prayers. In the times that we are facing, the dark times, we need to be in God's word daily. In addition, I encourage you, if you aren't already, to find a way to share God's word by teaching it to others. One of the things that been, has been restoring for me has been teaching Sunday school. When you teach Sunday school, you are responsible for sharing the truth of God's word to other people. And you don't want to mess that up. So that forces you to seek the scriptures. Because you're, we're responsible, it says in the Bible, that those who teach will be judged more severely. Because we're leading other people. So I would encourage you to teach God's word. Recently, I, I got my ham radios license. So I was at a meeting, and this one guy was talking to me. We are talking about the Lord. He said, you know, he's a retired Marine, an older guy my age. And he says, I've been teaching the Word. And I've been, I'm really enjoying, you know, teaching Bible study and stuff. But I'm thinking about, I need to go to seminary. And uh, what do you think about seminary? I said, I gave him this. This is a Japanese sign like, dame, don't do it. <laughs> and, and, I said, and he said, why? He says, what you're doing is the right thing. You're teaching God's Word. Find people who you trust are teaching God's word, the, the original meaning, seeking the original meaning of God's word, and learn from them and teach God's word. I said, it took me years to recover from seminary. He says, I, I, and I, I know some seminaries are very good, and I'm, not, I'm saying seminaries are, are a calling for some people, but there are some seminaries. I mean, I, I had <coughs> a particular case, is I had some. Very, very smart people that you could tell spent their whole life studying the Bible and God's Word in an office. And one thing about seminaries, this is a sidetrack, this is off the nuts. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but just, a, uh, just as an encouragement to, to teach the Word, is that um, they have to write books. So you have to come up with new things, right? And so you're always thinking, but the thing of it is, you don't have to add to this. It's simple, the simple reading, you know, to come to the Word like a child, you know, have faith like a child. And you have these intellectuals that try to make it say a new thing. And, and, and of course, there are many people that are super great teachers and that, that I follow, that I, that I hear. But, but I would encourage you, if you don't have time or the money, to go to seminary. <laughs> and uh, there are good seminaries, again. Think about teaching God's Word. It'll change your life. It's a huge responsibility. And God will bless you, and God will speak to you in different ways, and he'll speak to you in deeper ways than when you're not teaching, because you are his instrument for getting his word out. And in the fear of the Lord, it deepens your faith. So I, I'm thankful for just the opportunity to share at the Sunday school. It is a huge blessing for me. All right, let's read on verse, verses 3. What time do I have to finish? 12, okay, I got time. I got a lot here. But um, so he went on, he, so he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu. 
and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bore a daughter. Then God said to him, Call her name Lo Rahamah, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take upon that I will utterly take them away. Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah, will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by sword or battle, by horses or horsemen. Now then, she had weaned Lo Rahamah and conceived and bore a son. Then God said, Call his name Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. So Hosea takes the prostitute Gomer as a wife and has children with her. Hosea and Gomer's marriage is a symbolic of the relationship between God and Israel. And I, th I think it's also a symbolic of, of the relationship between God and his church. The name of the children say different things about the relationship as well. Lo Rahama means no pity. The name Lo Lo Ami means not my people. You know, this, this may seem very harsh because God's, God loved his people so much, he gave, them, he, he gave them over to their wickedness. And this is what we see in judgment, is when the people had gotten so wicked that the Holy Spirit is a restrainer, and you see him take his hands off these people and just giving them over to their wickedness. It, it reminds me, you know, in, in the time when, when I was a child, and I probably shared this before too, was when my mom caught me smoking cigarettes. She sat me in the corner and had to smoke the whole cigarette and was sick and can't stand cigarette smoke ever since. <laughs> you know, in, in, in a sense that the Lord allows judgment to happen because it's part of the discipline. Without discipline, they're, they, they were just going to continue to sin greater and greater. In this situation, Israel, their sin had got to the point of no return. It was continuing to spiral down. God was giving them over to their sin, and they were going to pay the price. Another way of looking at it is as a parent, you know, when you see your child running out the street, a busy street, and you grab them, boom, and you spank him to let them know that that is not happening. Don't ever do that again. If you do it again, it's going to be painful to you. Because you as a parent knows that if you don't stop that person, that, I mean that child, that child's dead. And so you inflict pain. So what's happening here is God loves us so much that he is inflicting pain. He is not, he is patient. And he is calling his people back to repentance. But when they keep refusing, there, there brings judgment. And we're, we go on, it says, you know, for, for us too, some, you know, some believe that this country is at the point of no return. I mean, and that's a, for, you know, opinion. You know, we're seeing the lawlessness and uh, where things, you know, considered, you know, just years ago would be considered criminal, put people in prison that are promoted. Now in even schools, we're seeing pornography, we're seeing sex changes for minors. This, last week I saw in the news in Orange County there was a big debate at the school board whether or not they, they should inform parents that their child, their elementary school child, is having a gender switch. So the, the school's saying it's not the parents' business. The parents are saying we want to know. And so just that, you know, you know, a few years ago, that would put people in jail in schools. But now it's like, it's... It's happening, it, it, you know, and, and coming up to, and, and it, might, it might already be, but they're talking about um, an AI Bible, right? An AI Bible, that, you know, politically correct Bible. It takes everything out, but they definitely would not do this sermon. So, and I did talk to a pastor yesterday who uses Chet GPS for his sermons. 
AI. What, what is AI? It, it, artificial, the name, artificial intelligence. And, um, and we're just seeing things like that happen. Of course, you know, anyway, <laughs> I should stop there. All right, Proverbs says, uh, in verse, uh, Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. We're seeing in our culture the loss of the fear of the Lord. And this is happening in our churches many times. And I, I'm, I'm around a lot of full-time ministers. This is not happening in this church, praise the Lord. But it is something that comes into the church. And we see it, we see it here that it, it, it was the priest, it was the prophets that was being rebuked. And so we also have to be careful. We have to be in God's word because they're coming for us all, meaning Satan, right? It's really not, our, our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6. It's against the principalities, the authorities, this is our age. It's a spiritual battle. So we're seeing a lack, or we're seeing a, a decrease or absence of the fear of the Lord. And we're seeing a lack of wisdom. You know, when you see what's happening in the world, you think, oh, our leaders, that doesn't make any sense. You know, that doesn't make any sense. It does make sense when you look at the scripture, when you say, when you take the fear of the Lord out, wisdom is gone. And so when you look at things and you think, this doesn't make any sense, that's probably uh, evidence that you have fear of the Lord. There's an urgency to make sure our hearts are right with God and to help other people get their hearts right with God. Let's read verses 10 and 11. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there I sh it shall be said to them, you are sons of the living God. Then the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head, and there they shall come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Jezreel will be, is, it actually means to scatter. But here we see the promise of the Lord that he is going to regather. So this judgment is coming. This judgment is coming. It's a done deal. The Syrians are coming. But he's saying there will be a day when Judah and Israel Judah, the two tribes, and Israel, the, the ten tribes, were going to come together and be restored. And they were going to be one government again. That means they were going to be their own country again. They're going to have their own gov government. During Jesus' time, they were not their own government. They were under Roman rule. From the, from the exile here until 1948, they did not have one government. 1948, they became one government, and it was a gathering of Israel and Judah. Another thing that we see here is that there was Israel. So although that Israel was wiped out and never fully rebuilt, Samaria, you know, Tyre, all these places that said wouldn't be rebuilt, they're beautiful places, but they're not still fully rebuilt because of war. But it says Israel will be there. That means some people believed, some people turned their hearts back to God and fled the northern tribe and went to Judah, and there's still all 12 tribes, which is prophetic. And this is why it's so important to study the Word of God and to study prophecy too. And I, I'm just, I'm, I'm the Sunday school teacher, and I, I got, I'm teaching through the prophetic books, and so I'll just give a brief commercial about this. Think about this. Over 200 prophecies that Jesus Christ was coming in detail right? Just not, no broken bones, piercing the side, going to walk on a, or, you know, ride on, on the, you know, donkey, and just over and over, over two detailed prophecies. Why, why did God do that? Because he wanted us to know. And I, I think about my kids, right? And, and those of you who have kids, you're, you're, you're spending your whole life, you know, we homeschool, spending our whole life trying to teach them, 
prepare them for what's next, prepare them for college, prepare them for life. And so we're trying to give them the most, help them to be successful because eventually they're gonna to have to make their own decisions. So we try to equip them. This is what the Lord is doing with his word. He's telling us what's gonna happen beforehand. From Genesis, right? Jonah, you know, one, one boat, one door, one way in. Repent. So, prophecy. <laughs> this is a prof prophetic verse that um, he's going to restore and that this one world government or one leader was going to be restored. Their country was going to be restored. And this is the time we live in today. This is a very cool time <laughs> to be alive. The final point we get from this message and I just realized that, is that um, make sure we are right with the Lord. So actually, that was my second point, too. So I, I was looking at it today. Wait, that's the same point as my second point. I said, oh, yeah. Okay, should I, should I change it? I said, no. Because that's, that's the thing with the Bible, too, that God repeats himself on things that are super important. And to make sure we are right with the Lord. The northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed and never fully rebuilt. Many were killed and tortured. Then over 200 years later, in 586 BC, the southern tribe was also destroyed by, by the Babylonians. And God gave the people of Israel many warnings, and the people of Judah too, yet most of them were caught up into idolatry and the lust of the world and perished in judgment. And there's a pattern of the Bible, and again, getting into the patterns of, of, of the prophetic part of the Bible is before judgment, God would remove the remnant of his people. Every time before the judgment, before the flood, he removed Noah and his family. Before Sodom and Gomorrah, he removed Lot and his family. You know, Joseph and his family were removed before the famine. And uh, it is a pattern that we have that and it's why we believe, and why the Apostle Paul believed that the rapture could come any day. Jesus Christ is going to come for his church. And, and I've talked to many pastors about this, and I think there's a misunderstanding that the second coming, they, I think the thing that's uh, uh, this, this is a misunderstanding is that uh, some people believe that the, the second coming is the rapture. Well, actually, the second coming is at the end of the tribulation. The rapture could happen at any time. And why is that important? Because it is a consistent um, pattern of the Bible. And, and I believe it, it, it's important for the way we live. If we know, like if we know a thief is coming to the house tomorrow, it changes the way we live, changes our preparation. But when we know that we could be raptured at any time, and all these signs are coming that are showing that the tribulation is coming, but I believe that the rapture happens before the tribulation, so which, which means that the rapture could happen any time. But um, I have a, one more verse. It's 2 Thessalonians 9.12. It says, The coming of the lawless one, they're talking about the Antichrist. And, then, and again, Antichrist doesn't mean against Christ. It means instead of Christ. Is accord, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send a strong delusion that they, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And it just, uh, again, the deception that, that's going on is, is also prophetic, that um, many people will believe the lie, and that's why we need to know the word. It says, uh, people fell away from the Lord and follow the teaching from the false prophets and other religious leaders, and, and we're seeing that today. During the time of Hosea was speaking, God's word to many people of Israel were deceived and turned away from following the Lord. And uh, many people in Japan, right? I'm, 
I spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of time in Japan, you know, haven't heard the word, and uh, we're making the word available. We're working to make the word more available to, to the people of Japan. But the thing of it is, is that many people in the United States have heard the word, but have turned away from God. And we're seeing that more and more. So, in closing, be in God's word so that his word can change our hearts. Be aware of the urgency of the time. We don't know when Christ is coming for his church. It could happen any time. Be right with God and be assured of your salvation through Christ's death on the cross. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Help us to know you and your word well so we won't be fooled by the lies and deceptions of Satan. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for sending your son Jesus Christ to pay the price for our sins on the cross. Lord, give us the courage and the love that we need to share the good news of Jesus Christ during these difficult times. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.